We do have a quorum, so we will proceed. Uh, I'd like to um, ask, uh, I'd like to uh, bring up the, uh, the agenda and I'd like a, to make myself a motion to amend the agenda. And that motion is to add an item under commission business. Uh, the item is related to the job description for the assistant director for the alternative response program and uh, an intervention by uh, City Council President Karen Paul. Uh, I'd like to make that at 645 time certain so that President Paul can be here. And Lacey Ann Smith has said that she will join us. And so Mohammed, if you would be looking for her, uh, and in fact email and send her the Zoom link and let her in uh, so that she can participate in that discussion. Great, thank you. So uh, I'd like to make that motion. Would there be a second to that motion? Thank you, uh, Commissioner Oski. Uh, any other discussion, any other amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, I'd like to take that to a vote. All of those in favor of the uh, amended agenda, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, passes unanimously. Uh, the next item of business is to approve the minutes to the commission meeting from March 28th. Uh, is there um, a motion to um, accept those minutes? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Oski, and if also if you may want to turn on your microphone. Um, go ahead. Is it not working? Thank you very much. And a second? I second it. Commissioner Rao seconds. All those in favor? Okay. All those opposed? Any opposed? All passes unanimously. Thank you. The uh, next item is public forum. Uh, Mohammed, do we have, are there any members of the public that have indicated they would like to speak? Anybody here present would like to? Please feel free to come up to the mic. So online we have uh, Dave Mahir who wants to speak. Okay, no, thank I'm you. I'm not allow you to speak right now. No. Hi there, this is Dave Marsh. Should I go ahead? Yes, Dave, thank you very much. Appreciate you okay, coming. No, no problem. Well, first I want to thank all of you for all the hard work you do. Uh, you probably don't know me. My name is Dave Marr. I've been in the Burlington area for just about 50 years. I currently reside in, in the New North End. And as you know, the city council will be working over the next several months to establish a police oversight board. And that got me thinking, and I have an idea I'd like to float. And my idea is to create a peer review board within the police department, which would be the first step in addressing any excessive use of force incidents. The board might consist of several senior police officers, perhaps someone from human resources, and perhaps someone from the police union. The details to be worked out, but this is an overall concept that I'm proposing. The board would review all incidents uh, of excessive force and propose dis disciplinary action if they feel it's warranted. Uh, this could either be a binding decision or a recommendation to the police chief. Uh, again, a detail to be worked out. Whatever action is taken could then be appealed to the city's oversight board once it's established. I think that a peer review board has several advantages. One is any disciplinary action will have been reviewed by a number of individuals experienced in police work, as opposed to just people off the street. I think it'll reduce the number of incidents that are referred to the uh, citizen oversight board. And I think it can probably be implemented more quickly than the proposed oversight board and might not even need a charter change depending on how it's implemented. So this is a concept that I'm proposing. Uh, it obviously needs more detail, but I think it's worth considering. Thank you. No, anyone more? Uh, okay. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, so we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Chief's report. Uh, Chief Murad's here, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, is this one connected to you as well, or is this just for the room? Is this, 
Is this yeah. one getting to you as well, or is yeah, it just yes. for the room? Great, thank you. Uh, I can hear it. I just wanted to know whether it was one of the, I should have slid around a bit. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yes, you can see the Chief's report here. Uh, if you'd go to the, the, that was a beautiful day as we took that picture there. First slide, thank you. Kids Safe Collaborative. We um, honored uh, a colleague in our department, uh, Mary McAllister. Mary McAllister um, has been with the, the department for decades. Uh, she is our domestic violence victims advocate and she was given the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Kids Safe Collaborative. Uh, and so we, we watched that uh, ceremony from One North Avenue. Uh, Mary was there and, and watched it from One North Avenue. And we had an opportunity to tell her exactly how much we appreciate her. Uh, as the victim's advocate, she is someone who liaises with um, victims, uh, is, is a, a key part of our, uh, uh, of our ability to serve victims, particularly victims of domestic violence. Um, and is, is someone who is, is really, uh, has, has affected a lot of lives in Chittenden County. Uh, people go to her, uh, including our domestic violence prevention officer, including other police officers. She's an integral part of what we are building in CAPE, uh, which is the, the portion of the department where we are, are working on social service response in addition to law enforcement response. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we finished up our fair and impartial policing training. Uh, this slide is, is similar to one that was in the previous chief's report last month. We divided the entire department into four, four cohorts. Uh, the first two cohorts each did two days of training last month, and the final two cohorts each did two days of training this month. Um, and uh, I think that training went well. From what I've heard from officers who attended, they were uh, impressed by it. They felt that it was effective. They felt that it was something uh, that was different than things that we had done before. And a lot of people came away knowing things that they had not known prior to this training. Um, there was a, uh, a important collaboration with Director Carson of REIB. She attended one of the sessions in this second group of uh, of classes, um, and I believe that she's contemplating using parts of this in other trainings as well. So, you know, if, if training that, that we uh, helped initiate, that she then helped co-develop, and uh, that CPE facilitated becomes something that we can use throughout the city, I think that's all to the good. Thank you. Um, so we are, uh, as of today, at uh, 64 total sworn officers, of whom um, 58 are available. It says 59 on the top sentence, but it's actually 58, as it says in the line. Uh, so 58 available. 26 of them are on patrol, which is a larger number than we've seen for a while, because we got our, our three field training officers uh, off of field training. They graduated and are now full-fledged police officers, and so that's great um, to have them out there as full-fledged officers. This is something I throw in every single one so that the world out there knows that we are hiring and, and here's what we're offering to do it. Um, here are some photos of, of the other roles that we are working on in the department. Uh, you know, that uh, is one of our, our new CSOs pictured there. She is uh, in all likelihood going to attend the police academy in August, um, but we were able to bring her aboard as a CSO now. Uh, from a new American community. Uh, I think she's, she's working really, really well. You'll see one of our other CSOs seated on the, the bench. Um, Lacey Smith is also shown seated on that bench uh, in the sunglasses. Um, and then uh, one of our CSLs uh, is there with our uh, therapy dog. That dog, uh, Rocky, is a dog that we have he is being trained as a therapy dog, is in the CSLs, uh, with the CSLs in the CAPE office, um, and is, you know, uh, definitely does a lot of therapy inside the building too, as well as with people who are using uh, our services or who are visiting CAPE. And it was brought to my attention today that, that somebody had told, I had a, a meeting with a city councilor today, and, and somebody had told that councilor that all of our CSOs were uh, were white men, and that's that's simply not the case. Uh, and I think that picture demonstrates it. You know, we're we're working hard on uh, making certain that we hire the right people, uh, the right qualified, capable 
uh, enthusiastic people for these jobs, and those people come in all sexes and all uh, races and all classes, uh, and we're bringing those aboard in all roles, in the CSO role, the CSL role, uh, the dispatcher role, and of course our police officer role as well. Um, this is our revised priority response plan, which also is something that I put in each one just so that people can see what it is and what it says those incidents are. And here's a picture of incident volume year to date. Um, we are up 33% uh, over last year. We're up 42% over 2021. But it is pri lower than prior years, but not by much right now. Uh, we're, we're barely lower than 2020. And that puts us back in line with those years, 2018, 2019, 2020, where the vast bulk of that decrease came from the voluntary reduction of traffic stops. Um, uh, any of the changes between 2018, 2019, and 2020 was driven largely by traffic. Which you can see in this, gra in this graphic here, uh, where you can see those huge numbers of traffic stops in 18 and 19, and the way they really just plummet. Um, and they, 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 were, they were already decreasing tremendously, but you know, we're, here we are uh, three months into the year, and, and we're talking about 153 stops. That's just not a number. More alarming, however, is what we see with regard to uh, stolen vehicle counts, what we see with regard to overdose count. You know, stolen vehicle is up half, uh, is, is up 100% from last year, and last year was as bad as it had ever, ever been uh, by a wide margin. Um, overdose is up, you know, uh, more than 200% over uh, the, excuse me, 300% over the previous year. Um, and, and that too was, was bad, although at, at this early stage last year hadn't really gone off the rails. If we take a look at the next slide, we'll see uh, priority one incidents higher, last year was higher than they had been since uh, in, in several, several years. This year is already on track to be higher still. Uh, a good portion of that is driven by overdose, which you'll see in the very next slide. Overdoses are, are uh, shocking. It is shocking where overdoses are going. Um, and uh, this, what we see is that last year uh, really took off in the middle of the year, on June 1st. So a very bright line distinction. It just goes up. We don't know why. I have not been able to determine what it was that happened at that moment to, to cause those to go so shockingly high. They're far, far worse this year. Uh, I mean, that trend line, if, if, if we don't do something to interrupt that trend line, it will be well off of this page. Uh, we will simply have to continually rearrange. I mean, we're talking about on track for, I don't know, 800, 900 in the year. Uh, that is, you know, uh, absolutely shocking. Um, next, please. This uh, graphic shows where they're happening uh, in the entire city in the graphic on the left, and I, we zoom in to the city core to see where they're occurring uh, on the right in that, that cutout. Um, no surprise, we see a lot in the vicinity of uh, downtown Burlington uh, City Hall Park. The uh, garages in the vicinity of City Hall Park on King Street, on College Street, uh, the municipal parking garage on, on College, between College and, and, uh, and, and Cherry. Um, we, there are, uh, excuse me, Bank and Cherry. There are, uh, you know, several locations where that's happening. And that is it, although there was an element to this report uh, that Commissioner Rao requested, which had to do with um, uh, our, our media policy and our press releases. Uh, you know, this was a press release. We put, I put out the chief's report each month uh, in a press release. Uh, but the question was primarily about uh, press releases based on incidents and, and how we uh, arrive at those. And, and what I explained um, was that our, uh, you know, we do have a PIO. That PIO joined the police department in February, um, is doing great work getting her feet under her uh, and already a really valuable addition to the team. Um, but what we put out is dictated in part by bandwidth and in part by, you know, the severity of the incident, whether we feel that it, it occasioned a certain amount of public interest or not, um, and whether or not we're looking for somebody, for example. Uh, there are, uh, you know, other, some agencies basically put out a press release for every single arrest. Uh, that's not something that we can maintain even with a PIO. Uh, it's simply not going to be something that we can do. Um, in the past, we have not always been as quick to do the releases as, as possible. It was primarily I or 
Lieutenant uh, Michael Henry who were writing those press releases. Um, and uh, I have other duties that might interrupt between being able to write one and put it out, uh, Lieutenant Henry as well. If Lieutenant Henry is the actual officer in charge on a shift and actually at a scene that requires, that, that, is, that rises to the level of having a press release, uh, he's got a lot of other things he needs to do before he goes back to the office and writes that press release. It is, in fact, probably his, his last uh, order of business is to write that release and, and put it out there. Um, but he is the one who really, uh, and I, I credit him for it, um, picked up the pace of our press releases in 2021 to some people's consternation, but I think to the overall uh, you know, good of the public to understand the volume uh, and types of incidents that we were seeing. Uh, we do still want to do that. Um, we certainly want to be able to uh, have less time in between incident and press release. Uh, similarly, we want to be able to do press releases on more incidents, um, and I think that the PIO is going to allow us to do that, but she too has other duties that she's, you know, working on as well, including the public coordination part of her title. Uh, she is the community engagement coordinator, um, and so there's there's other roles there. And she's working closely with our redaction specialist to uh, do actual, uh, to do work as well as redaction, and she does work on those redactions. Uh, she's the voice that you now hear on the use of force that we, the uses of force that we make public and put up on YouTube. Um, but she also works with the redaction specialist to some of the, some of the photos that you saw in this chief's report are mine, uh, the landscapey ones outdoors, the ones of uh, CSOs and officers in the field are, are her. And so the redaction specialist and, and the PIO are out there trying to, to get some uh, art and imagery and to be able to tell stories that aren't just about our press releases and our incidents, um, but are also about the things that we are doing and endeavoring to do in order to, to serve the community better. They're working right now on a project about CAPE and the CSLs, um, and you know I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that. They did a, a terrific project on our use of force tactical training, uh, the physical training that we do for jujitsu, um, interviews with officers inside, put that video up. I think it's a really good video for people to watch, not only because it shows the tactics that we train on, but because it shows a department that is uh, that is doing well internally. You had a lot of people in that who were, in, who were happy to be in this agency, happy to be working with one another, and I thought that it was a, a good uh, representation of why people should come work for this agency. And that's what we want to be able to do as well, to, to do work that we can use to both regrow, rebuild, uh, and connect better with the community. Uh, yes, so Commissioner Kamaha. Mike. First question is, what are the strategies you're considering uh, for the overdoses? Second question is, what, how do you account for the large increase in stolen vehicles? I think they're part and parcel. I think they are, they're intimately connected. Uh, you know, our burglaries are, were up last year. They're not up this year compared to last year, but they're up way compared to previous years. Uh, ditto larceny, aggregated larceny is up. Uh, and again, you know, even if this year might be a little bit up or down from last year, last year was so tremendously different than previous years. I don't carry retail theft on this chart, but it is also changed from previous years. All of those are part and parcel to the same basic underlying needs. Not every single car theft is a car theft by somebody who suffers from substance use disorder. Not every single larceny is somebody who suffers from substance use disorder, but a predominant number of them are. Uh, you know, what are we doing? We are not, uh, we're not doing much in the way of enforcement for these kinds of acts anymore. We have as a community decided that we do not arrest people for mere use or, or possession. Um, we have, as a, as a function of both the pandemic and I think choices made at the court level and state level, we do not put people through the system for these issues. Uh, we do not jail, much less incarcerate. Um, and I draw a distinction there between holding somebody in jail and actually putting them in prison. Uh, treatment court is, is significantly full. Uh, there are, you know, remove, there are fewer uh, options for some of these kinds of uh, issues. Um, and uh, the, the general focus that is, you know, if you can go back, actually, Mohammed, to the, the, um, the table there, thank you. So, you know, with overdose there, it doesn't really show up here because this is only as of April 15th. But if we were to look at, at the year-end total that was in our year-end report that we put out in January, what you would see is overdose numbers um, in the 70, I want to say it was, for 2017, uh, because the last year's showed 2017, not 2018. Um, and I believe that you then saw 50s 
for 18 and 19, so 70 for 2017, 50 for 2018 and 2019, and then it began to climb. It climbed into 100 and then um, high hundreds and then the 200s uh, for 2022. And that climb for overdose, and these are not fatal overdoses, these are just overdoses. Um, I, I, we are so understaffed on supervisors that I worked the midnight shift last week on a Wednesday into a Thursday. I had to respond to a fatal, uh, what we call an untimely. Uh, all deaths are considered untimely in our categorization system, whether it is a person who is 106 and was, was you know, lived a full life and there's nothing untimely about that passing, or whether it is a, a child who dies. They, they are all considered untimelies. We responded to an untimely at four in the morning. It was just me and the one police officer. That was the entirety of the coverage for the city. Um, we responded to that. I have every reason to believe it was an overdose based on statements that were made, uh, based on history of the persons involved, but we won't call that an overdose death until the ME rules on that and does a tox. So that's going to be weeks to months away. Um, and that's carried as an untimely, not as an overdose. These overdoses are things to which we respond in the vast majority. There may be one or two in there that, that, that had a death associated and somehow remained an overdose, not an untimely, but it would be very, very few. These are going to be incidents in which officers respond. They get there to the scene most often before fire does uh, and before other emergency services do. Uh, they administer Narcan or maybe somebody else has already done so, friends. There's lots and lots of Narcan in our, in our community now, which, which is a good thing. Uh, that person usually is revived in one way or another. More often than not, if revived by the Narcan, because sometimes somebody's encountered who isn't actually you know, they, they are, they don't, they're not Narcan, they're, they're breathing, a passerby thought them to be an overdose, uh, they probably have had some kind of, of uh, drug experience, but they may not be overdosing in a medical sense, and that person is woken and roused and, and will leave on his or her own. Um, but when you actually interrupt uh, an overdose via Narcan, Often as not, the person is quite angry at the people that have interrupted that. Uh, will give some expletives to the officers or, or medical personnel involved and leave. We attempt to have a CSL uh, interdict with each of those and connect with the person, uh, assuming that the, we get, even, assuming the person's still on scene or that the CSL can arrive or, or in, in a timely fashion. Um, assuming that we know who it was, that we get an ID, uh, but we, we don't have the ability to, to compel anything from that individual because we are considering that not to be arrestable. Once upon a time it was. Once upon a time it was assumed that there was going to be possession involved. Maybe the possession was entirely inside the system by that point, but sometimes it wasn't. There was another piece of, you know, uh, there another amount of drugs somewhere on the person. Uh, it was certainly reasonable suspicion or, or, uh, to assume that that was the case, and we would undertake to detain the individual, identify the individual, and potentially arrest the person. I believe that in some of those instances, uh, arrest would lead to uh, compelled treatment that was to the person's benefit. But that is not what we currently do, and and largely that is what we want. I don't want to start re-arresting people merely for for suffering from this disease, um, but we are seeing huge numbers of it. Uh, I think that there are aspects to that increase that are not merely um, the, uh, that, that also have to do with the fact that the drugs that are currently being used result in the belief that overdose has occurred more often than they used to. Heroin by itself tends to create, if, not, if it creates a full overdose, then people are frightened by what happens and they, they, you can see that a person is overdosing. But if a person uses and, and doesn't overdose, it creates a, a kind of sleepy stupor, a person who stands and, and almost cannot fall down. That does not occasion public calls for overdose. A person in, a, in, an, in an area where that is, is common or where they see it, in New York City on the subway, for example, if you see someone who appears to have used heroin, you don't call that an overdose. You just say that's somebody who's clearly you know, using heroin right now. The drugs that we see now tend to cause situations that, that go beyond that, that go to collapse and, and shallow breathing and symptoms that are, are more shocking to both friends and passerby and cause that call to happen more often. I don't think that we are going to see nearly a commensurate rise in fatalities as we have with overdoses. And that's a good thing, right? A good gosh, if we see a commensurate rise in fatalities, the way we are seeing with overdose, that will be absolutely shocking and horrific. 
but I don't feel that we are seeing that yet. I'm not seeing that in calls. Again, I, I did go to one just the other night that I have every reason to believe was a fatality driven by overdose, but um, I'm not seeing the degree of increase in those kinds of calls that we've seen with regard to overdose calls. So maybe there's an element to these new drugs that is not, uh, that is not causing the same level of fatality by ratio, and I wanna be clear by rate, because I do think our numbers are gonna go up. I don't think that our numbers can't go up when the overdose numbers are this precipitously higher. I don't know that precipitously higher is right, but this, you know, shockingly higher. Um, that said, uh, it is, you know, these, the drugs that are, are more prevalent now have to be used more often. Um, they uh, do, as I said, cause more alarming uh, symptoms that, that, that appear to be overdose. Um, and, you know, we, some of the treatment methods that were showing efficacy against opioids are not showing as much efficacy against these drugs. So there's a whole, a whole host of challenges that are arrayed in front of us as we look at this data. But, you know, a, a new focus on it is absolutely necessary. That, you know, that chart is shocking. I'm sorry, Commissioner. Commissioner Oski. Quick question. Um, what percentage of the cars are recovered? I hear stories from other places, like near ports, where they steal cars and they drive them onto container ships and they're gone. I heard here that it's mostly like joyriding and sleeping in cars. Um, do, do people get their cars back? Thanks for that question, and I'm sorry for having lost the thread on the previous question, which had to do with other crimes like larceny, et cetera. Um, our car thefts are almost entirely recovered. The notion of cars that are recovered with some sort of, uh, you know, manipulation of the steering column that indicates it was quote unquote hot wired, to use the older terms, uh, or that has a screwdriver sort of, you know, wedged into the key uh, slot. Is, is infinitesimal. The number of cars that disappear to be shipped off to, you know, where ports south in New York or north in Montreal and then taken someplace else, also infinitesimal. These vehicles are recovered. They are recovered in states of oftentimes uh, what the insurer will consider to be a total. Um, not because of external damage to the car, although that happens too. We do recover these at crash sites. Um, but because people vomit and defecate and use narcotics inside them. They are filled with needles and the detritus of, of human suffering and uh, the recovering owner free, infrequently wants the car, uh, frequently calls and doesn't know what to do about how, what do I do with all this stuff in the car? Um, sometimes expects uh, the police to come and recover it as evidence, which it, it is not. Um, the number of cars that we've dealt with being stolen at this point means that we don't, we don't take those as evidence uh, of a crime at this point. The state's attorney has made it very clear that we have a, a very high hurdle to clear in order to call it a stolen vehicle. Um, you know, Vermont doesn't really have a stolen vehicle uh, statute. It sort of does, but mostly doesn't. They call it operating without an owner's consent. Uh, many other states do. Grand larceny auto is actually a separate category of the seven majors uh, across the country with regard to tracking major crime by the FBI. We can't even track that because these aren't, most of these are not considered grand larceny auto. Uh, they're considered what other states might call unauthorized use, um, or as we call it, operating without an owner's consent. Uh, they are oftentimes, you know, the state's attorney has said that, that she believes oftentimes these are being used to live in. And as a result, even if certain hurdles are cleared to prove that the individual found in a recovered car is also the individual who stole that car, because that's what we have to do. It merely being in the car is not proof. And a driver of a stolen vehicle who is stopped and turns to the officer and says, oh, I got this from my friend Dave. Dave who? I don't know Dave's last name. That's enough. We no longer have enough to call that, uh, to charge that person for, for possession of the car. We, we, we keep the car, of course. We don't let the person drive away in the car if it's known to be stolen. Um, the person may very well have other crimes that he or she is, is wanted for or warrants or conditions of release from previous instances. But insofar as the car theft, you know, we have to be able to say this is the person who took it. And that, that takes a lot of, of evidence that we're not developing on most of these cases. Um, but she has said that, you know, if, if a person is living in a car, uh, what are we supposed to do about that? How are we supposed to address that? 
my position is that the, the, you know, these cars are oftentimes the only thing that people who have them have. These, these are necessary for people to get to work. These are necessary for people to, to live the lives that we have in, in the 21st century. Um, and they are being denied these and, and furthermore oftentimes denied in a way that permanently denies it. Mere recovery is not enough to get that car back. It's done. Um, and, and we have to do something about that as a community. A portion of this, however, is this. The majority, probably the vast majority, are cars that are stolen because keys have been left in them and or the vehicle has been left running. And the people of, of Chittenden County and Burlington have to stop doing that. I do not want to blame victims. It is not victims' fault that these happens. This is because unscrupulous people may be driven by, by disease and desperation, but unscrupulous people make a choice to commit a crime and take someone else's property. That's who does this. But there is an element that is being caused by the fact that we as a community have long thought that we can get away with leaving our cars unlocked or keys in them or leaving our doors unlocked, and we have for decades. This chart tells us it is not working anymore, at least not with regard to cars and to a certain extent with regard to property in the form of larceny. We have about Thank um, you. 10 more minutes before um, President Paul will be here, but I think there are several more questions for you, Chief Murad. I have a few. I'm going to see if uh, any of my other commissioners here do. No, I don't. I think okay. Already answered the whole okay. Great. Um, w one of my questions is with regard to Comstat. So, a number of years ago, Comstat was used extensively to address the opioid epidemic. Is that not uh, a vehicle that could help us today? And I recognize that's not entirely the BPD's purview, but just. Oh, not 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 entirely, but hardly at all. I mean, mm -hmm. we attend. Uh, I think that certainly. You know, then Chief Del Pozo had an integral role in, in creating it. Um, at the time, it was run by Jackie Corbelly, who was in the <clears> police <throat> department. Uh, she's now working for us on a part-time basis, getting uh, the crisis team on, on uh, up and running. Um, so very glad to have Jackie back, but she's not working in this capacity. CompStat is now run um, out of a different part of the city. Uh, I, I try to attend uh, on a regular basis. Um, but, you know, I think, as with many things, uh, the, the inability to meet in person um, for a long period of time, uh, the, the, the fact that, that many of the, the key participants were burdened tremendously by, by crises du jour that, overweigh, that outweighed this, although I think that what has happened is the urgent has crowded out the important. We have so many things that are urgent and we are losing sight of what's important, which is this, but it, it's not, it is, I, it, could it be, you know, with, with a significant application. In fact, the final component of a CompStat process, which was invented by uh, my mentor, Bill Bratton, um, and Jack Maple, who was his primary strategist at the NYPD in the early 90s, uh, the final component is relentless follow-up. Um, and, and I think that on some level, uh, we, we, were, we have not been as adept at the relentless follow-up as we once were when it comes to issues that came out of Comstat. Who has addressed this specific person? We have this overdose. What was the, the story behind it? We have a fatal overdose. Who among us in this large group of people, all of us uh, stakeholders, none of us singularly responsible, and none of us pointing fingers at the other, who among us had a touch of this individual? When did we touch this individual? What did we do when we touched this individual? What could we have done differently or better? Or next time, how can we prevent somebody else, uh, their photo and their name from being at the front end of this CompStat process? Uh, because that was a component of it, was to look at the faces of the lost. Um, you know, I, I, th those are all things that do remain within the purview of that process. Uh, it's proven to be effective. Uh, the, the criminal, you know, the crime change across America is because of CompStat um, from the 90s into the 2000s and early 2010s. And STAT as a, as a process has been used in innumerable different venues uh, beyond just crime and beyond. I think what was really genius about what the mayor did was making it not about an inter, excuse me, an intra-agency process, but making an inter-agency process with a lot of different stakeholders. Thanks. Um, when you mentioned that there are different drugs now than heroin. What drugs are we talking about? Fentanyl, um, fentanyl, but it's being combined with street drugs uh, that, you know, including certain kinds of things that are meant for animals, things that are, are meant for 
uh, other kinds of use, um, and it's being diluted in ways that uh, are, are different. We're also seeing a good deal of, of crystal methamphetamine. Um, so meth is prevalent in the community. It doesn't really cause those overdose numbers as much, although it can, in some instances, cause some of the symptoms that can, uh, can result in a person sleeping in public in a way that might occasion a passerby to call about it. Um, but it's not the same overdose. It's certainly not the same overdose with the immediate dire medical consequences in general as either fentanyl or, or heroin. That's not to say that you cannot fatally overdose on, on meth. You, you can, but it's a different process. Um, I see President Paul is here. If you'll just indulge us five more minutes, just a couple more questions. And we are gonna stick to the 6.45 time. Uh, with regard to the um, the training with CPE, it sounds like it was a very positive um, experience. And wondering if we, you could share the training materials with the commission? Uh, I mean, I, I could ask CPE about that, but I don't see any reason why not. And just curious about what are you, is there a follow up to this? Do you have continued plans for training with them? Uh, at the time being, no, although there have been some individual training plans for individual officers. Uh, John Monahan, who was one of the instructors from CPE, has a number of, of sort of wellness initiatives for officers, and, mm -hmm. and I think those may be appropriate for specific officers. I don't know that there are things, you know, uh, getting, the, getting the entire department to do two days of training is an incredible logistical hurdle. It's a massive logistical hurdle. Um, there, uh, you know, we were in the midst of some other kinds of, of operations, that is, you know, patrol-based operations, uh, where I had two or even three officers available for those operations because of the fact that we were sending everybody to training instead. Um, but that's the trade-off that we, we currently make. So getting the, the wellness things that John has suggested for everybody is, is not likely. Um, for a couple of different officers, perhaps officers who can bring back some techniques to share with other officers, uh, I do think that that's something that we're, we're looking into. Um, and those, but, but I, to be honest, I don't know whether those are specifically CPE related or those are things that John Monahan himself sort of works on and does. Um, and uh, insofar as, you know, further training, this is our FIP training for, for this year and for next. We don't do it again from the state's perspective until 2025. Uh, but we do have to do uh, a, a training on systemic ra systemic oppression issues again in 2024. So what will that be? Uh, my hope is that, that REIB is going to have developed training by that point that is um, uh, applicable to shift workers. The challenge that we, the reason we created this training was that REIB did not create shift-based training before it suffered certain staffing changes that made, that, that sort of made that fall apart. Um, my, uh, myself and other non-sworn, non-shift employees in the department did do REIB's training last year that they put to the first round of it. I'm hopeful that there's going to be another round of it developed and that that will probably be what we do in 2024, but it remains to be seen. How, would, how will you deal with new officers in terms of FIP training? They get it at the academy. It's Good. a component of their academy training. Okay, great. Just one quick final question is, is, does the department have a media policy that guides the content and type of incidents that are reported? That are reported, you mean in the form of press release? Yeah. Uh, we have a media policy. Um, there's some stuff about, that talks about what kinds of incidents go out, but it's not prescriptive in the sense of saying every single aggravated assault or every single X. I'd have to find that directive. It has something to do with the idea of what I said before, sort of severity mm -hmm. of incident, uh, whether or not it seems to have occasioned public concern, um, et cetera. Great. Would you mind um, having perhaps Shannon Trammell send us a copy of that or a link to that? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, it is 6.42, three minutes early. I'm going to invite uh, President Paul up to the microphone, and uh, while she's coming. Uh, Lacey Ann Smith is with us as well. So for just for those who are watching and for members of the audience, uh, the commission received from the mayor's office a, dis a job description for the position of assistant director of alternative 
Chief Murad, what is the rest of that alternative crisis the, response? Uh, no, it's the Assistant Director of Alternative Response. Oh, um, alternative. And I, I don't know that that title is necessarily the one that we're going to use. There uh -huh. are some counselors who have expressed uh, a desire for us to explore something different. Okay. Um, but that is what it currently uh, says in both the memo that went to the Board of Finance last night and the, uh, the draft job description. Great, Assistant Thanks. Director of Alternative Response. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the uh, mayor's office had sent uh, me a copy of that job description and asked for input on it. Uh, we had thought there was a very short timeline for responding to that, and it be I became aware of the fact that we actually, some changes have been made to the uh, alternative crisis response program that is being imagined, and in, in, lo in light of that, it felt like our, any comments we provide would benefit from an update on what is happening. Uh, so for, at least for myself, for example, we understood that Howard Center put in an RFP for this program, but that the nature of that, the structure of that has changed. So I felt that it would be useful for us to have that update from President Paul and uh, Lacey Ann and, and the chief. Uh, the job description, the draft job description is on board docs under commissioner comments for those who would like to look at it. And once we hear this, uh, I'll try to develop a mechanism for us to provide another round of comments to the mayor's office on the job description if necessary. And so uh, I, with a great deal of thanks to President Paul who is, attends way too many meetings and to Lacey Ann who is uh, not supposed to be working this week, I deeply appreciate it. I'm gonna invite President Paul first to update us and then invite Lacey. And I think I uh, wanna add that um, several commissioners had questions about that job description and concerns. I spoke to Lacey about them, but I do think that's a, an opportunity for commissioners to directly ask questions of Lacey herself here. And I think the public would benefit from hearing those responses. So, President Paul, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, I I'm actually, to, to a large degree, here to answer questions. I'll just provide the background of what happened yesterday so you're sort of completely up to speed on exactly what's going on. Um, last week, this has been a very fluid situation regarding the what is what we all refer to as the CAHOOTS program. Um, and that is that you are correct, um, Commissioner Seguino, that there was an RFP that was done. Um, the Howard Center responded to it. Um, to make a long story short, uh, the, the Howard Center is not in a position, according to conversations that have been had with them recently, to really truly prioritize this program. And we've waited now for two years for this program. This program was brought to our attention by two parents, um, Shea Totten and Robin Freedom McGuire, um, who have very patiently and consistently advocated for this program. And um, it's been an evolving process, but we're now at the point where we have the funding. So usually, usually the stumbling block is we don't have the funding. We do have the funding. And in great, in, in great measure to the fact that the city council and the, in the mayor's budget allocated $450,000, I believe it was, um, last year, which rolled over into this year. Um, and um, certainly a, a, great, uh, a great feat um, and a lot of work done by the mayor to secure the, the other remainder of the funding from the state. Um, the UVM Medical Center is a, is, a, is a strong advocate in this. They are, way, they are totally on board with, with, this, with, this, with this program. In order for us to be able to have the program work in the way that we had envisioned it, which one of the key components, as you may recall, is that we wanted to make sure that, um, just like we like data from the police department, we want the data. We want to know how this program, you know, we want to be able to measure success um, and be able to measure progress, and you can't do that without data. Um, the Howard Center was not, um, was not willing to share that data with us. And so that was, a, that was also a stumbling block. Fast forward a, cu a couple of days, this has literally been a couple of days, um, and Lacey can certainly speak to this far better than I can. 
there has been a new development, a new way of approaching this that will get this on board much more quickly, um, and it will mean that the, uh, the program will be housed within the city of Burlington. For a number of reasons, um, I think there's a great deal of uh, optimism that these positions can be filled, mostly due to the hard, hard work of Lacey and also Jackie Corbally. Um, and we can get this up and running because right now there's like, we don't want to hear any more reasons, explanations about why this program hasn't started yet. And this is the way to really get it up and going, plus we will have all of the data. Um, the other thing also is that the mayor and I both met with um, Shay Totten and Robin Frieden McGuire late last week. Um, they are supportive of this direction to a large degree because they also want to see it get going. Um, and they feel confident that it will, be, it will be a successful program housed within the city of Burlington. So that's where the CAHOOTS program is that won't be called, the Cahoot, won't be called CAHOOTS, but you all know what I'm talking about. Um, at, the la at the meeting last night, at the Board of Finance meeting, and in conversations leading up to that meeting, it became clear that despite the fact that there was, it, because of the fact that it's been very quickly moving, um, there were people that haven't, that didn't hear that conversation. And although it is a small component of the overall job description, it is nonetheless a component of the, of the job description. And when you were given the job description, we didn't, we didn't know this because it hadn't happened yet. But it has happened now. And so uh, there was a strong desire to have um, the police commission weigh in on the job description now that you know what we know, what we all know. So we all know the same thing. And um, so that's where we are. But, you know, the work that has been done to bring this forward has really been on the part of Jackie Corbley and Lacey. And Lacey is here, I'm gonna guess, on, vac on when she's not supposed to be. So I don't, wanna, I don't wanna take all of this away from her and let her speak to this as well, because it's been some amazing work. Lacey, can Thanks. you fill us in a bit? Uh, so what will the new structure be uh, if the Howard Center is not gonna t take the leading role? So the real change is that ultimately the, the position that is going to, that is considered to be the assistant director position was really just going to be facilitating the relationship if it was going to be with an outside entity and overseeing the advisory committee that comes along with the creation of, of the CARES team, which is what we're calling the team. So it's going to, is CARES. Just, and I don't remember what CARES stands for, so I can't rattle that off quite yet. Uh, it, oh, no. is, it is a great, and that was the chief. Um, so uh, because of the fact that Howard Center is no longer going to be the contracted uh, partner and the city is taking it on, the assistant director position is going to essentially be overseeing the team itself as the super, supervising the, the structure of the team, as well as maintaining the relationships with the advisory board and uh, with UVMMC. So it's just really, the relationship was already there. It, the, what changes is really kind of just the, the degree of detail and supervision that would exist. I, you know, just um, if you'll, if, if it's okay, maybe Lacey, you could just sort of describe um, for those who aren't aware, the advisory, the, that layer of oversight and what will, what that advisory board will be. Yeah. So the advisory board is um, by way of recommendation of UVMMC and it ultimately is set up to really be um, pull in community stakeholders to not only be reviewing data, but really making sure that the kind of mission and spirit of what we are trying to attempt with this team is, is we're staying true to that. So we'll be looking at incidents when law enforcement is involved, both from the perspective of um, the team having to call them out, as well as if the team responds and they are already on scene. Um, and just making sure that, again, that the reasons and why these relationships and these things are happening fall true to what we 
believe is the mission of this of this team. So it, it will be made up of multiple community stakeholders to inc include um, at least one individual um, that is just a uh, quote unquote citizen um, with, a, with life experience, really. <laughs> Great, thanks. And uh, I had asked you this question, but I, I wonder if you could, uh, for the sake of everybody, what's the difference between CAPE and CARES? So those are both yeah. acronyms. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't know the <laughs> words yeah, no, to go okay. with either, but uh, perhaps you can yes. enlighten us. Yeah, so CAPE is really the social, services, the social services that currently exist within the police department. So that is the CSLs, the joint position with the uh, Community Justice Center, the Victim Services Specialist position, the DV police officer, the victim advocate, um, and we also have the data person that spends part time at, over at the building. We are all housed in one wing of the department. Um, and Rocky, sorry, he's an important member of the team. So, care, Rocky is the therapy dog, sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, the CARES team is really expected to be kind of, for the most part, oh, sorry about the camera, is expect it. sorry i know it's awful um the the team itself is expected to be really existing out into in the community they they will have an area that they will obviously be able to have a desk at but we want them to be as mobile as possible so the integral part of the team will also be the van and having the van that they will have everything that they need to be able to triage from within that, that vehicle. Um, and so they will have a home base, but the intention is for it to really not um, be utilized in the same sort of way as um, a team whose job might consist of a little bit more administrative duties like the, the, like the CSLs. Let me ask commissioners if you have any questions for President Paul or Lacey Smith, Commissioner Comerford, uh, the microphone and... Yeah. This is for our president. What was the initial intent of having it at Howard Center? What were we trying to, what was our goal there? They were going to be doing the, on the, on the street, this work directly. We were going to have a contract with them. Where I'm going with this is organizational culture. So that in my mind, there's some real differences between police culture and organizational culture, um, which is one of the reasons I thought it was great that it was going to be at Howard Center. But I think we have to think through this. And I'm, this is also for you, Lacey, next, uh, the, same, mm -hmm. the same issue, and also the chief. Um, they're really different organizational cultures. Um, and so I think that's really important in terms of going forward. I don't have an answer now that Howard Center is off the table, but I'd like you to speak to that a little bit. I mean, I'm happy to try to. Uh, you know, the, um, I think that's one of the reasons why the creation, again, you know, this is not my job description, right. <laughs> um, but um, I think one of the reasons why I am supporting the job description and the position is that um, I think that you're right, that it, it, it should be a non, um, a, I would say non-sworn, but I'm more thinking a civilian position. Um, and I'm hoping it will be someone who is a, you know, a social, a social worker, as someone who has a degree in social work and understands the differences. And, uh, you know, the, the CAHOOTS program has been incredibly successful, so successful that a lot of other communities have modeled after it. Um, and part of that was because it was separate. Although it did have, it did go through dispatch, um, and others, you know, I'm sure the chief can speak to this much better than I can. Um, but uh, it is, you know, we live in a small town, and there was only one response. Um, I think the Howard Center has got a large number of their own things going on, and it wasn't going to be a priority, and so. Um, I think having the advisory board 
um, will be that added layer of hopefully assurance that we are getting a culture that is indicative of the culture that we want. Did we check out um, the medical center and ask them if they would host? They, um, now I'm trying to remember, and Lacey, you can remind me, there are two teams, one of which will be a person employed by the medical center. Is, isn't, is, it, is that right? I'm, I'm trying to remember, there were two teams, um, and yeah. I saw it once, so maybe you can, or maybe the chief can speak to that. So the intention with UVMMC currently is that we will be doing cost sharing because we feel like a nurse, having a nurse be a part of the team is really um, extremely valuable. And we have someone that is actively already doing community medicine, which is really um, a, a specialty, I would say, within the medical field. It's definitely not the same as working in four walls. So um, that was, we, the clinician position specifically was not originally part of the conversation with UVMMC. It was really specifically just around the nurse. And so Howard Center originally with the clinician position was really just to be about the supervision of the clinician. And that was the, the nature of the relationship there. Um, I would say I have a I have a couple of thoughts in terms of culture. Um, I think that I mean I have opened I have opened and extended the invitation to both Stephanie and others around to come and see and experience what it is to work in the Cape office. I think it would also be beneficial for folks to be able to talk to the CSL team and see what they think without me there, without any of the others there around what the culture is of working within um, under my supervision. Um, I work with a lot of Howard Center employees. Um, I came from Howard Center. I would just say that I think that there, um, that culture differs depending upon the department, depending upon the team leader, depending upon all of it. It is extremely variable. So to say that just the organization as a whole provides a certain degree of culture, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, and, and I will also say that like in terms of hiring, I have not had the issues that I often hear spoken about on a regular basis in terms of hiring. I have had more than enough qualified candidates. I have more, way more, I'm denying people based on like, I, I'm, I've, we've gotten very lucky in terms of, there are people that are interested in doing this work and that I have a list for one position. And so I, I do think that, that, that there is a lot of kind of, assumption in terms of what it's like to work in a in in a in a wing of a department like we're not integrated by any stretch of the imagination we are separate a separate wing so we create our own culture we create our own space and we are actively working with the folks within the police department to include law enforcement but if i recall the cpi guys was it cpi the people that came and did the training who go all over this country and meet with police officers spoke of that we have some of the healthiest like culture in that they've ever experienced by spending days with us in terms of the degree of conversations that we were happening around the immense series about how we dug in and shared and so i think that i would just argue that if there are questions and concerns around culture then just please come see the space come meet with the people come talk with them about what it is to do the work and ask them what they think and how they feel about it. Yeah, I don't think there's a nefarious element in this on either side. I, I just do believe it's, it's probably healthier for the long term to have our own space, but we do live in a small community. Uh, I would characterize sort of Howard Center and social worky kinds of organizations as cultures of care. And I think the police department is, is much more hierarchical um, than um, 
probably is healthy for a social worky kind of an organization. So we, have, we see it a little bit differently, uh, but you're in it, I'm out of it. Um, I see it from an outside and not even, you know, sort of, um, let me say it this way. Organizational culture is deep and invisible in most cases, but it does kind of seep in over time. That's my only comment. And I, and I would encourage you also to talk like, we're, we're involved with the National League around public safety social workers. This is like, we are part of the conversations and the growth. We have four or five other police departments that have already reached out to us about the, about the Community Support Liaison Program and they're modeling their programs, their community service wings, departments that they're trying to create based on what we are doing here in Burlington. So I understand the sentiment. I'm never going to be able to dissuade anybody from it. You're going to, you know, you are entitled to absolutely believe what you'd want to believe, but I would always encourage anybody to like, to also come and experience things and have an, a, an understanding of what it, what it is in a contextual way and not just kind of in theory. Any other questions or comments? Um, thank you, Lacey and President Paul. So let me just say the following, that I think that we need to just sort of digest this and reflect on the job description. I so deeply appreciate you deferring that. And what I'm gonna ask is that it's too abrupt for us to try to do that right now. I'm gonna invite commissioners in light of this information uh, today is Tuesday night by Thursday morning to have given me any additional comments that you like. The first round of comments I did send. If you have additional comments, please send those to me by Thursday morning, and I'll make sure they get to the mayor's office and um, in, in preparation for your meeting. And I, I, I just want to say also I apologize to the extent that we've slowed down the process, but I felt that it was important for all of us to have buy-in. I think we're all hugely supportive of this. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we know, that we have the information that we need to know that we can provide really informative comments, um, I felt that it was important to take the time to do that because I think we all wanna do this together. So thank you and apologies for disrupting the process uh, and the delay. Thank no, you. It, it actually makes the it, it actually makes the outcome far better. So everyone is everyone feels like they've been they have hopefully been heard. And yes, and certainly if you can get those comments by to us by 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 Thursday, that would be ideal. Um, and I think as someone did mention, um, it was actually former Commissioner Grant who had um, raised a concern about, and I think a very valid point or at least in my opinion, about the name of the position, the title of the position. You know, I think alternate may be a word that we use a lot, but it's not really what we probably should be using. Um, there probably is a better word. Um, if you all come up with one, um, that, would, that would be great too. Um, and any other comments that you have um, will then be integrated into the, into the job description or at least be, be a part of the record and we will, we did, we did vote to have a special Board of Finance meeting next Monday. That probably will be around five o'clock. Um, and that agenda gets posted on Friday. So if you can get them by Thursday, that is ideal. Okay. Um, and thank you, thanks for your time. Thank you, thanks so much. And Lacey, thank you. We owe you something for breaking up your <laughs> time off by coming here. I do hope thank everybody- Thank you for having me. Um, I do hope that you all will take Lacey up on her offer for us to visit the CAPE offices. Uh, and pre perhaps if you'd like, I can coordinate something so that we all don't go at different times. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the update on the website. Uh, Commissioner Rao. Thank you, Commissioner Segrino. Um This is gonna be very short. Our website is actually now up and running live, thanks to Mohammed, who has been working diligently. Um, we're still looking for some content for those people. I, I send a, the link around. We're still looking for content. We are still working with having your bios and your uh, photographs up there. 
I'm also soliciting any additional information, any additional links. I know Commissioner Comerford had talked about doing more educational links. So I think I'm very intrigued by that as well. So if you find anything that you would like to include, just forward them to me. Um, from the public perspective, um, there is a lot of information there already. Um, but if you feel, even from public of people who are listening, uh, don't hesitate to email me or uh, Mohammed to get, give some input and some suggestions as well. Um, at the current moment, we have no, um, and maybe other commissioners can weigh, on, weigh in on this, we have no uh, plans to have a social media profile for the commission but we can return to that discussion in the future. I think for BPD, that makes more sense. You know, there are some very pressing information that needs to go out as the chief has already talked to today. But for us, I think, I think we, can, for, we can put it, we can table that idea, uh, but I'm open for any discussion and any input on that. So that's, I think, about all I have for update. So I would like to ask commissioners if they could have their bios and any of that information by Friday to Mohammed. Pardon? Okay, all right, great. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the use of force reports. Um, so there are two parts to this. The one is the this month's use of force report. DC Labrec is here. Welcome DC Labrec. And uh, it, so a couple of things. So we have now been um, asking for all of the videos, so we would repeat that request, and we've asked commissioners, individual commissioners, to make sure that every video is viewed. And last month, all of that did happen, and there were no, there, there were no incidents that raised concerns on our part. Uh, there was from December 2022, and I'd like to turn to that in a moment, but first want to do what we have done in the past, which is assign responsibility to commissioners to look at these use of force incidents. There are six this month, and there are five of us, one, two, three, one, two, three, five of us here. Um, uh, I'll ask Commissioner Garrison to take one as well. So if, if you don't want all mine, I'm just gonna assign based on who's here. Um, Commissioner Keefe, incident one. Commissioner Rao, incident two. Myself, incident three. Commissioner Comerford, incident four. Commissioner Oski, commi incident five. And um, Kevin Garrison, Commissioner Garrison, incident six. And Mohammed, if you would send him a note to inform him of that. Yes, sure. Great. Uh, so I wanted to turn to uh, an incident from the December 22 report. And I just wanted to say, I was a, a little uh, unclear as to how to proceed on this. You've been sharing these reports, DC Lebrecht, and we haven't really provided much feedback in the past. I did check with the attorney to see if it was appropriate to talk about this in public session and it seemed that it was, so um, I'm open to alternative ways of doing this in the future, but I will just mention the issue with regard to that incident. This was the incident uh, in which two men were fighting at a new place, and um, it was determined who the aggressor was after interviewing uh, bystanders, and throughout most of the four videos, the officers and, and fire department handled the situation with calm and patience. I mean, it was really very commendable how they handled it. One of the, con the concern that was raised, however, is that the description of the arrest and the use of force report doesn't appear consistent with the video. And if you don't mind, I'm just gonna read from my notes here to explain that. Um, the, the use of force report, in the use of force report, the officer told the, states that he told the arrestee he was under arrest and to put his hands behind his back. He then said that the arrestee shouted in the officer's face and turned to walk away and then the officer brought the arrestee to the ground. In the video, um, it, 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 at least for those of us who viewed it, the arrestee did not try to walk away in contrast to the use of force report. Uh, and it, in, uh, instead, the officer told the man he was under arrest and then immediately threw him to the ground. So I, I'm, not, I'm not 
suggesting we're critiquing here the actions, but we are concerned that there is a discrepancy between the use of force report and the video. Um, so, yes. I, you are not reading their use of force report. It's a synopsis that I've put together based on their use of force report. So, everything in there is a generalization of what occurred because, quite honestly, I, I don't, I would spend my entire job um, trying to put all these together. So, that is not, those are just, Summaries, synopsis, whatever you like to call them of like trying to give um, the reader a general idea of what was occurring. They are not the actual use of force report written by the officer. That, Nor do I have time to watch every single video that would take even beyond my retirement, probably, if I had to do that, um, as I'm sure you're all aware. Absolutely. Um, so those, so those reports are just a synopsis like you would get, you know, and how accurate they are. Like I said, I try to be as inclusive in them as I can, but they're literally, it would be pages and pages and pages of just me writing the synopsis. Um, just wanted to underscore, that, of course, that it is important that the officer affidavit corresponds to the video. So in cases well, like this- in Well, let me add to that too. Officers do not include the uses of force in their affidavits. The state's attorneys want the facts of what happened what the crime was committed, the elements of the crime, and that's it. They don't want the the use of force report. So officers don't copy their use of force report into their aff affidavits. Report is a personnel record. And yeah. How? So help me understand. I, I'm not sure what to do with that statement. The concern here is that the narrative. It's not a statement. It's what's required by us from the state's attorney's office. They don't want the use of force report included in the affidavit. The affidavit only contains the person, how they're identified, the elements of the crime, and witness statements and stuff like that that support the criminal charge, not force that was used to take the person into custody. Uh-huh, I see. So a personnel report is? A personnel record. The it, use of force reports are personnel records. Uh-huh. Not part of the affidavit. Uh-huh. So I'm a little, confused about what we should do here because, as I said, at least the synopsis is not consistent with the, with the video. Should we, therefore, ignore the synopsis? I, I don't know what more I can tell you that, other than the fact that I tried to put together a, a generalization of what occurred in, in, the, in the event based on what I've read and, and what's in the incident report what the original call comes from, I go between two separate, um, I guess, uh, well, they were one, they were one um, program, Valcor, but now I have to go between our use of force system that officers write the reports in, I have to go back into Valcor, I have to go back and forth between them and officers' statements and incident uh, reports versus their um, actual use of force reports. So I look at both of those and I, try to come together and put together the best synopsis that I can of the thing. I may have misinterpreted when he wrote the person, I watched the video, the person did try to move, didn't walk away from them. He actually tried to walk by the officer. Um, so that could be what the officer was saying. Like he tried to walk away, meaning he tried to walk by the officer. His arm away from the officer and, uh, and does not allow the officer to grab him and take him into custody and he is moving past him. So I think what, what part of what's happening here is that what DC Lebrecht does with those use of force synopses is not dissimilar to what we do with a press release. It's not the entirety of the incident, nor is it every single specific of the incident. We've pledged to make certain that those use of force documents include the, the, the sum and substance of the use of force, certainly include the demographic information included, certainly include the use of force that it entails, uh, but um, the notion that they were complete and total pictures, I don't think is, uh, is part of being a synopsis. Similarly, the videos that we now show for certain kinds of incidents, uh, based on our agreement, um, those videos don't show the entirety either, right? A, a body camera is a limited tool. Uh, it's better than anything that we've had before. 
but it's not the sum totality, nor is, would it be if we had an overhead camera that showed some sort of overall picture of it. That would not be the sum totality. There's always going to be aspects of individual uh, subjective understanding of the incident, and that's from all parties involved, whether in this case it's the three officers who were on, present, on scene, whether it's the witnesses, whether it's the two subjects themselves. Uh, but the synopsis endeavors to be a clear synopsis that it contains the demographics, the data that people have said they wanted, the nature of the use of force, and the rationale for the use of force. And I don't believe this one was actually inaccurate insofar as that goes. I think that the, the commission differs on that, but I appreciate your input on that. And I certainly appreciate, D.C. Lebrecht, the enormous amount of time it must take you to put together these reports. So thank you for that. Uh, any other commissioners have comments? Okay. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item, Commissioner, I'm sorry, commendations. Um, they are posted on board docs. Um, Mohammed, would you like to read these or just briefly summarize them? I can read just one and all the okay. report is in line already. So, uh, uh, so a resident wrote um, a message uh, saying, just uh, read the news about the Can incident. you talk louder, please? Yeah, sorry. Uh, he's saying, just uh, uh, read the news about the incident with the fellow uh, in crisis that was uh, subdued with a less than lethal gun. Great job, man an excellent example for intelligent response. This is the sort of thing that helps make Vermont uh, the best place in the world to live. So as I said, the rest of the uh, commendation there are like written in the board docs. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, there were several commendations this month. So I encourage folks to read them of the CSLs, uh, officers, and so on and so forth. So thank you. Um, for that, Mohammed. The next item on the agenda is uh, commissioner updates and comments. Any commissioners that have any updates or comments? Okay. I, I, yes, can, I, can, can I, uh, Commissioner Seguino, uh, can we return to the commendations just for a moment? Um, I would like to personally thank uh, the Burlington Police Department for appearing very quickly when a toddler and a mother were hit on King Street. I witnessed it. I was there. Um, and I think he, BPD arrived within, I would say, within 60 seconds to a minute um, and were incredibly helpful to not only the family, but also appeared to be very helpful to the staff of King Street uh, Youth Center as well. So I just want to note that, return to that sure. momentarily. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, we are going to move into executive session, or uh, let me put it this way. I want to make a motion to uh, enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA A4 to discuss disciplinary actions against employees. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Commissioner Rao. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, we will not be making any decisions at that, uh, after that meeting. Uh, and therefore, we will move to, I would like to ask for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn from Commissioner Comerford, seconded by Commissioner Rao. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Thank you.